Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Hashtag Real Talk with me, your host, Aaron Bragg. Besides being your host, I am also your guide on this crazy world that we call information security. I have a very cool topic to talk about today, but before we get into the topic, I'm going to do things a little bit backwards to shake it up because it's fall here in Michigan. The leaves are starting to change. I even put a, a screensaver on the TV for the YouTubers to, to calmly see that the, what the leaves are changing. Um, my guest today, I have two special guests, Rob Walk and Dougald McNaughton. See, I butcher. I'm notorious for butchering last names, but I got to admit, this is the first time I could ever butchered a first name. So I'm going to go with you, Rob, first, and then we'll get into the topic. Uh, can you tell everybody about yourself and what you do and, and, and why do you do what you do? <laughs> the why part is probably the harder. So uh, my name is Rob Walk, as, as Aaron mentioned. Uh, I work as a senior security engineer at Tenable. I've been here about a little over five years. Um, before that, I worked for a global pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacturer here in West Michigan, um, doing uh, vulnerability management, security engineering manager, stuff like that. Uh, why do I do what I do? Because I'm not good at anything else, and technology seemed to be easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. you realize out of like this, I think this is the 70th or 71st episode, 71st episode. And that has got to be one of the most honest <laughs> responses I've ever gotten. So you you take the cake on that. Uh, Dougal, please introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. My name is Dougal McNaughton. Good old fashioned Scottish name here. Uh, I've been with Tenwall since the beginning of the year. Prior to that, I was with two other companies in the past 23 years in the IT and software uh, space and some security as well. And I cover enterprise accounts here in Michigan. So definitely, uh, you know, love working with you guys and the organization and everything that uh, everybody does here. And, you know, I'm all about uh, learning every day, learning from the customers, learning from the company, learning from the solutions and uh, see how we can bring alignment, right, to the solutions we have to the problems that customers are trying to solve. Excellent. All right. So the topic, because we're a couple, we're like two minutes in and everybody's going, Aaron, what's the topic? Well, hopefully you went to Buzzsprout or YouTube to realize what the topic was just before you cold dived in. Uh, the topic is vulnerability management. This one's especially important to me right now because um, for the older listeners, they know that I work, my day job is I work for Spectrum Health as one of the lead information security analysts. Um, and recently we, um, merged i want to say i think that is the polite term even though it's a little bit more than a merger uh with beaumont which is a major healthcare uh system on the east side of the state so we're based out of the west so for the new people uh we're about to become a top i think almost a top 20 healthcare system and then when you count hospitals we'll be top 12 so i am about to hear that well not me personally, but I, as an organization, I'm about to inherit a lot of uh, a lot of new devices, right? That I'm not familiar with. They have a security team that's a little bit smaller security team, some super talented people, but they didn't have you know the resources and the budget that we were fortunate enough to have um, in the Spectrum Health side. So vulnerability management is going to be a hot topic for me. So. I guess my first question to you, Rob, is, you know, knowing I'm about to go into a big unknown, what do you fix if there becomes so many different vulnerabilities? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough question that, you know, having the advantage of, in this and being a practitioner before, right? The question we always asked, how do I prioritize? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges organizations face is, is prioritization. And there's a number of ways to do it. There's CVSS uh, vectors and you know CVSS scores. And, and part of the challenge with those is really that CVSS wasn't designed to tell you how quick you need to fix the, the vulnerability. They, they tell you the technical complexity or the, the technical severity of it, but not the risk of it, right? I, I call that uh, exploitable versus exploited. You know, what we want to know is if it's being exploited in the wild and what we have to do in order to fix it. And so a lot of the larger organizations are ones who are really mature. They've taken in threat intelligence feeds and other things and created their own algorithms to figure out how they can uh, appropriately assign risk to vulnerabilities in their organization. And so what we've seen other vendors in the industry doing, including Tenable, more recently uh, in the last few years is 
coming up with a risk-based approach, right? So risk-based vulnerability management. So for us, that's assigning a score, an additional score to, uh, to vulnerabilities, right? So you can prioritize utilizing threat intelligence feeds uh, to then look at the, those vulnerabilities that are most impactful, right? Or, or pose the most risk to your environment, really reducing the total number of vulnerabilities that you have, right? So the ones that are exploitable, the ones that are not just exploitable, but currently being exploited. And so that, that's where I would start uh, if I, on my journey, if I had to go back into it. If I was you. So, so no, 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 that's, that's, that's a good segue. First of all, I broke one of my own rules. I forgot to say, if we, if we use an acronym, we have to say what it is. So C, what does what is CVSS stand for? Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Excellent. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it is a mouthful. Uh, what's the, I mean, let's, let's dive in a little bit more to the downside of CVS, CVSS scores, right? Because one of the big problems that I'm running into with the business leadership is, is quantitative versus qualitative, right? So I might get super excited because, wow, you know, a CVS, CV, CVSS score, you know, here's something quantitative that I, you know, that I can then show the business, but you kind of brought up a good couple of good points of maybe that's not the best approach. So digging deeper, what is the downside to just going based on CVSS scores? Yeah. So uh, the downside, one of the downsides, and you mentioned it, the business, right? How do I communicate with the business appropriately? So, so one of the biggest challenges with CVSS and it, it became worse CVSS version two, right? What is being grandfathered in a sense. Now we have CVSS version three, when they created CVSS version three, they added a category in critical. It used to be just high, medium, and low for CVSS version three, CVS version two. CVSS version three added a critical category, but they also adjusted a bunch of other things for their scoring. And what happened is now 60 some percent of all vulnerabilities are high and critical. Let's pause for a second. 60, 60%? That seems like a, that seems like a, big number is there any reasoning behind that or is it just software <laughs> software is moving so fast and it's just crazy that it is what it is because that seems high to me yeah I, I think the challenge is the way that they added impact into cvss version three so before it was they just scored the technical severity of the vulnerability by itself and in version three they added an impact score so basically the impact means if it impacts an operating system versus an application, uh, and you can then move laterally because of that. So they tried to add in some lateral movement capabilities. Okay. In a sense. Okay. That's my understanding of it. The people who know are going to be like, that dude doesn't know what he's talking about. High level. You don't have to worry about engineers <laughs> yelling. This, These are high level conversations. Uh, high level. I tell my engineers all the time that I'm butchering technical details. But when you have to talk with a business, this is perfect, especially with small and medium businesses. So don't worry about like nitpicking. <laughs> so, so what happens is then most of them become high and medium because a lot of the vulnerabilities out there are operating system related or, or can have impacts on the operating system. So that, that's my understanding of why there's so many. So then the challenge becomes, how do I explain to the business if all of them are critical or I have so many and I, I, I give them a report and that report ends up being 300 pages of gerbily gook that says, hey, go fix all this stuff. How do I distinguish which ones are important? And so, you know, by looking at additional details on those vulnerabilities, things like, is it currently being exploited in the wild? Um, how old is the vulnerability? What's the coverage? So, so in terms of, um, you know, product coverage of that vulnerability, what's the threat recency, threat intensity? By looking some of these, at looking some of these other things that actually dis distinguish risk, you can have a different conversation with the business than, hey, this is CVSS nine or ten. It's bad because it has all these technical severities. I can then go to them and say, look, this vulnerability is old. We should have fixed it in our environment a long time ago. The threat intensity is really high. It's a very recent threat as well, and and you know the product coverage for this is large as well. So we can really get impacted by this. So when we talk about doing things a little bit differently in terms of risk, we also have to bring the business, have a different conversation with the business and the information that we bring them. 
Now, is that something to wear longevity, right? Like I, you know, I'm going to sound like a noob for a minute, but remember as an analyst, I, I know a mile wide and an inch deep, right? I have engineers and some really good, good architects for that. So I don't really get into too deep of areas that maybe secure email, maybe firewall, maybe, you know, network access control. Longevity, I never thought about because in this day and age of cyber insurance going up and them coming up with new questions all the time, that could, that itself could be a risk, right? Like, let's say, let's say there was an incident, they did an audit, they pull up, you know, they're using a tool like Tenable, right? They pull up their report and they see, wait a minute, okay, yes, we saw you dressing X, Y, and Z, but you have th this length of time on this one, you know? What, what, what was your excuse for that? Why did that happen, right? Because what if you brought up the point of something that's not a threat like right now being actively exploited could be tomorrow that coupled with longevity really increases, really does increase that risk, doesn't it? Absolutely. And this is, this is something I, I speak with a lot with organizations. Like I have no idea how vulnerabilities get, like legacy vulnerabilities get on new systems. Right. It happens though. Like they just <laughs> yeah. show up. It's like, it's like, I can either problem. confirm or deny that it happens. Yeah. Like, like mice bring like stuff over there, you know, like they're like hoarding, you know, like preparing for the winter or the fall, like they're grabbing all the leaves and the pine cones and they're, they're shuttling them under, you know, in some woods or something. Um, so, so the challenge then becomes, or, or in a lot of like, you know, we're in Michigan, a lot mm -hmm. of manufacturing here. Mm -hmm. So what we see in a lot of manufacturing are, are, legacy devices that they can't upgrade. You know, they're, they're attached to machines that are millions of dollars and the software is no longer supported. And they're not gonna, you know, from a manufacturing perspective, the business does, it says, doesn't make sense to go upgrade that, that system for, you know, that whatever control is being, you know, whatever machine is, you know, being controlled by that out-of-date software. So you've got, you've got this risk that's gonna stay, but we need to identify it and understand it and, and be able to at least articulate that risk to the business which is a little bit different than the security, what we used to do in security, right? We used to kind of own risk as well. So to me, the way we should be working now is security is kind of like um, not deferring risk, but identifying risk and, and communicating that appropriately to the business so they can make the right decisions. So most, a, a great example is WannaCry. Most organizations still have WannaCry out there somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So being able to identify that as a risk, right? Being able to identify those things and being able to uh, articulate why it's a risk, utilizing you know threat recency, threat intensity, those kind of things, because people don't understand, right? The business doesn't understand what that means. CVSS, it's been exploited. Great. How does it get in? What do I do? You know, th those are the things that are that are uh, we can utilize to help articulate those things to businesses. So when you talk about risk-based vulnerability management. Something that comes to mind for me is like uh, you're talking about outdated systems that really aren't a good investment to replace, right? So, uh, you know, a good example for me would be PAX machines, right? We're talking about, you know, upwards of a quarter of a million dollar piece of equipment that is still functional. It's still doing its job. But I have this true story could be running software from the days that Steve Jobs was running his old company. Like this is a thing. But I like where you're going with that idea of risk-based vulnerability management because then we could partner with the business. Okay, you're not going to go out and spend a quarter of a million dollars to get the latest Siemens device right just because it can handle patching and everything else. That's not a good business value. But using the reporting maybe from a solution like yours, maybe we can identify and shift maybe some compensating controls, right? that pack system. Okay. That pack system. Tell me exactly what it, it needs to talk to. Right. And then we work on putting compensating controls around that so that it's only talking to this workstation. And then this workstation can only through group policy or other means only talk to, you know, your, your EMR like Epic or Cerner. So that's that's a way to use your solution that that I that I didn't think of before, and obviously uh, I I'm I'm preaching to the choir in that regards. But is there knowing there's stuff coming down the pipeline and things are changing? Is risk based vulnerability management even becoming dated? Is it is is there a new wave for us to think about it? Yeah, I, I think there is. I think 
you know, moving to that next step is, is how do we do this across what's called the modern attack surface? So the challenge we, we have, we used to have, right, in, in traditional vulnerability management, which we did for 20 years, um, and we never did it really well anyway. The challenge was nope. really around, <laughs> you're, you're being honest. <laughs> <laughs> there was around, um, you know, servers, workstations, and network gear. And that that is expanded, right? The, the the modern attack surface is now that plus cloud, plus operational technology, plus web applications, plus your external attack surface, plus Active Directory or any type of identity service, plus all of those things have the the potential to have vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Now it's not traditional software vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. but there's there's a there is a potential for all of those to have some type of vulnerability, right? And they're, they're different types, right? So we think of um, traditional IT stuff has CVEs and misconfigurations and things like that. Then there's, you know, from, a, from an internet facing, you've got URLs and shadow ITs and, you know, forgotten things that I have. I, I open a firewall rule and I, you know, no one, when we decommission stuff, no one ever like takes the firewall rules out, right? I mean, they forget, <laughs> not part of our deprovisioning process. Not anymore. We had a project to clean that up, but I will say that in the old days, yes, that was a real thing. So what, what do you call that? Right. I mean, like, yeah. so Gartner's you have created, such a big breadth. Yeah. Gartner's created a new category. It's called, so love or hate Gartner, right? Everybody <laughs> falls into one of those camps. I have mixed feelings with about Gartner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but most of the, uh, most of the executives follow Gartner in some way. Right. That is and true. So, it, it's called continuous exposure management. And so we've come out recently, uh, and I think others are, are moving along this line as well, uh, around exposure management. So the idea is to take that risk-based vulnerability management approach mm -hmm. across the different, the, the modern attack surface, across those different pieces um, in the modern attack surface, and then roll that up into unified visibility, right? I don't call it a single plate of glass, but the thank you. <laughs> really, to get, really, it, it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really to get that that visibility across across the attack surface, and then being able to prioritize and measure. So the the thing that we hear a lot from organizations is, you know, I've got all these siloed tools. They all, in some sense, identify risk. And the thing I want to point out here that I think is important is everybody's got these remediation, they have a lot of remediation type tools. So, mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. you know, tools that are, are, are look at the two, two categories. There's the, there's the pre and the post, right? So it's already in my network, I wanna catch it, right? CrowdStrike, you know, EDR, the, those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, SOAR, already in, my, already in my network, you know, something's happening, you know. Then there's the, the pre side, the, the risk side, where are my risks, right? And exposure management is really about identifying the risks before anything happens across that modern attack surface. And so that's where you'll see Tenable and, and others as well starting to focus some time is how do we, how do we take all those vulnerabilities, whether they're, they're traditional vulnerabilities or whether they're config misconfigurations, and how do we assign risk to those and then roll that up to give a, that, that view of what the risk is in my environment, especially including those different asset types and giving the overall view. So I can then go look at AWS, and for instance, and say, okay, I have some traditional EC2 instances. I have some cloud stuff that's, you know, accounts and firewalls and, you know, VPCs. Uh, I've got some Lambda and some Kubernetes. And how do I mm -hmm. look at an AWS instance and understand what my risk is in AWS across all of those. Maybe I have some identity out there and, and understand what my entire risk is from that AWS instance, not individually across each component. And that to me is what exposure management is, being able to break those down across the different silos. That's kind of a cool concept because, you know, like this, you know, my healthcare system, you know, we're, we're branching into cloud infrastructure even more because it's a necessity, right? We know that <clears throat> companies, Salesforce in the cloud, right? Epic, Epic, a traditional on-prem provider, you know, moving to the cloud. I like where that thought is going because you may, we actually may in the future and theoretically, right, may have an issue to where 
we have, you know, we have something that we've built in AWS that's connected to a third party, right? That's feeding data to a government website. I'll take the I'll take the insurance side example, right? Like the uh, our party health wing, we have to deal with new transparency rules. It's like we're putting more and more information out there around like cost cost of surgeries and all this other important information. But these paths are challenge are challenge us internally to put data in different spots. So I never thought about that. How cool would it be to be able to see? Okay, yes, we have may have done this with our on-prem development server that's running this application, right? Our our portal, <clears throat> but it's using to your point a lambda function to collect a web service from this third party data and then we have to feed it to the government how embarrassing would that be if there's a break in that supply data supply chain right let alone physical supply chain it becomes a data supply chain look at that gartner you, you, you i just chain. created my own new category data supply chain data supply chain love it um but you're right right so i could have a vulnerability where it might not be a high it might not be high risk there but that combined with another issue over here now gives that lateral path, right? So I love that you guys are thinking like that, right? Because that can give me a broader sense of, hey, Aaron, you know what? Traditionally, you would have went, we haven't patched this AWS config in 30 days. Uh, okay, we're not seeing any ex exploits. That's a medium. Your on-prem server you know, you haven't upgraded your web application firewall, you know, that's a medium risk. But those combined, right, as we're sending data out, well, now if you add that one together and that one together, now you're going to get a little bit higher risk because you're affecting that whole workflow. That's pretty cool. I mean, is there any, uh, where could somebody get more information on that? Do you guys have like a, a white paper on your website or be able to get more information? Uh, I'm sure we do. Um, we we had a, a product launch yesterday on it, so uh, we actually launched the product. good timing. So yeah, so there's some webinars uh, coming up as well as uh, as well as some other things. Um, the last thing I'll mention about that though that I think is really interesting is is you mentioned attack path, right? Pathways, mm -hmm. as well as as well as inventory across all those. So the other hard part about that is not just identifying the risk, but what are the assets in that category? So what are all my assets in terms of identity, in terms of, you know, whether it's a cloud resource or a traditional resource? And then if I have, what can I do with those identities? So if I have some identities, you know, along that that data, what did you call it again? It was data supply chain. Data supply <laughs> chain. So along that data supply chain, what is the attack path? So being able to understand all three of those, so in terms of risk, identity, or, or attack path, and as as well as all the assets in terms of what that, um, in terms of, you know, whether you, however you group it, but across your entire attack surface. That, that's, you know, to me, what I hear organizations asking for when they think about how do I consolidate my tooling, right? Especially around preventative controls. And then, um, you know, where, where I think the industry is going in terms of what Gartner's saying and, and what we're starting to deliver. So it's pretty neat. No, that is good stuff. And no pressure on your marketing team. We need to, us, us analysts need some white papers and webinars, actually a good idea. Cause obviously you do right. Get CP credits, which is an acronym that I actually don't know. I know that SANS it's used everywhere. SANS CompTIA, but I actually don't know what the meaning is for CPE. Is CPE? I know it's continuing professional education. Is oh, Hey. <laughs> Rob saves the day. <laughs> I don't care what Google says about you. You'd be wrong. You're I, all you right, know, Rob. I most likely am. I think I just met it, made it up. So <laughs> it sounds it sounds good, and we won't we we won't hold you to it. Um. All right. As we're winding things down, what do you? I like to end on positive notes, right? Because I we just talked about something that's a little bit scary, not too scary, not super fuddy fear, uncertainty, and doubt. What are you looking most forward to in 2023, knowing that your company's starting to adapt to some of these changes? What are you, what are you most excited for next year? 
Uh, wow, that's a good question. So I think, so I, I, I truly enjoy what I do. Um, and so for me, it's continuing to hear from organizations, to work with organizations, uh, to, to help them understand how they can change uh, their internal processes to become more mature in, in what they're doing in terms of vulnerability management or you know, exposure management. Um, you know, you've been in security for a while. Security is people process technology. Technology is an enabler for the process and the people need to create those processes. So I really enjoy the people process side. And then we we talk about technology later. So like, you know, Google's on the phone, uh, on the call here with us. It really, for me, it's about, it's about understanding the people and processes first and where we work and then helping them identify what technology or show how the technology can help them uh, succeed in their people and processes. And that's what I love to do. So that, that for me is, is first and foremost, no matter where the technology goes. I want to add on that too. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that Rob and I love to do too, is when we engage in conversations, we love the, where are you at today? Right. Where do you want to be in the next, you know, 12, 18, 24 months when it comes to vulnerability management, it comes to, you know, you know, risk-based and this kind of exposure view that we're talking about, how can we help you get there? Right. And, and that, that's a joint effort. That's a really, really fun conversation. Excellent. Well, Rob, I appreciate your time. I'm going to kick it over to Dougal for a minute. You have, well, first of all, before I give you two minutes, I have to say a huge thank you. Um, as listeners know, we're trying to raise money for a STEM scholarship for an awesome up and coming young college student, female college student next year. I have three daughters, so I'm a little partial. At some point, I do need to I do need to give the guys out there some <laughs> love and too. But this particular scholarship, a STEM slash STEAM scholarship that we're going to be partnering with the right place for. So your money is going to a great cause. Dugold McNaughton. Yes, you're right, Scottish. You have two minutes besides some of the stuff that Rob talked about, which is pretty cool. Um, why, why would a company want to schedule maybe a 30 minute conversation with you? Yeah. I just want to kind of piggyback, uh, on the stuff that Rob brought up, right? Because when you look at that modern attack surface, right, it is ever growing, it is expanding, uh, different types of assets, variety of assets, as he mentioned before, it's dynamic, uh, it's becoming increasingly interconnected, right? And that is a challenge. So when you look at Tenable, I mean, our, our pedigree, you know, with our Nessus heritage, I mean, people no tenable generally, but they think of us as, you know, that traditional VM and you're the Nessus folks and so on, which is absolutely true. It's, we've driven a lot of innovation and leadership in the VM space for, you know, 20 years. But when you look over the last couple, you know, three years or so, both from an R&D standpoint and from an acquisition standpoint, and what we've done to bring additional solutions into the fold, right, to deal with those other components of the modern attack service, right? Whether it's the, you know, the OT, the cloud containers, identity, you know, uh, web apps, the, the you know, uh, external tax service management, that type of thing. It's all about bringing those products into the fold so that you can have, you know, uh, uh, solutions that, that, that take care of the, the, those blind spots, right? That being said, what's interesting is yesterday, timing is great. We did announce what we call Tenable One, right? So Tenable One is that exposure management platform that, that you know, Rob talked about earlier. And I would say it helps in three key areas that are, that are critical and important. You know, one, gaining comprehensive visibility across that modern attack surface, right? That unified view of all the assets, no matter what that asset is and their associated vulnerabilities, right? Whether they're configuration, software, entitlement vulnerabilities, you know, no matter whether it's on-prem or in the cloud and helping them to understand where they're exposed to risk. Uh, and then, like I said, monitoring the internet to you know, discover rapidly and identify those external facing assets. I think the second key bucket that Tenable One addresses is uh, applying that context to anticipate the threats, right? And prioritize the efforts to hopefully prevent attacks accordingly. And, and it talks about the attack path, right? Helping to understand relationships between the assets, the exposures, the privileges, the threats across that attack path as well. And and continuously identify and focus on you know what's exploitable you know where what are those breach pathways that cre ultimately create the most risk and i'd say the last bucket really is being able to communicate the cyber risk to make better decisions right that centralized business aligned view of cyber risk kpis to show progress benchmarking to compare you know against other other peers in the industry as well and actionable insights 
on the overall risk, as well as getting you know granular into departmental or operational units. So I say this, you know, the, the siloed tool approach, which everybody's been doing, you know, it's inefficient. It, it, it lacks focus sometimes. It produces different metrics out there. puts you know most organizations in reactive mode. I heard this yesterday. When you have the siloed approach, each tool is going to say, "Hey, here's the top ten things to fix." Right. Well, then guess what? If you have 10 tools, here's 100 things you have to go fix. How great would it be to, across that entire tax surface, here's the top 10 across that entire tax surface, right? That ultimately is going to reduce the amount of risk. So Temple One gives that global exposure view uh, to hopefully anticipate those likely attacks and, and ultimately reduce that exposure in a proactive manner. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. I like you, so you you got one you got one extra minute, so we're we're good with that. No, I'm just joking. I oh, we do appreciate your guys' sponsorship, Rob. I I told you you're you're like how long do we have to talk for? And you were worried that it was going to be forever and boring. And I told oh, you that it would go did. pretty I was, quick. I was looking forward to like you know all afternoon. So we <laughs> talk about this today. So no, thank you for for having me and and the conversation. It's great talking with you. Excellent. All right. Great work, man. We really appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate it. And to all my listeners, we will see you soon.